Ooh, when we get a graphic? That's been a while. It's been yeah. a while since you've been on. Or did you just forget? We got a graphic? We got graphics. Yeah, we got now. a graphic. Yeah. It's beautiful, huh? See, John has stepped farther back from the camera. Yes, I and, have. And you are super far back so as to I'll make my head as large as so possible. Your head I'll do is this. as big as possible. And my job here is done. There we go. <laughs> so Wonderful. We get ourselves to all look the same size. Now I need to be a lot closer. Yeah. yeah, never mind. Hello, everyone. Hooray! Look, it's We've the got th everybody. It's the three of I, us. How do I get it? Wait, you are going the wrong way. There you are. There you are. But isn't the thing supposed to follow you? I don't know what's have happening. Have you got that turned on? There is a thing. No, I don't have that thing. I've got uh, the different camera. Remember, I've got my new camera. Yeah. But Which team, new camera is that? Oh, thing, this right? is the fancy camera. Ooh, I like the fancy camera. Yes. It Ooh, makes my lights. eyes pop. Ooh, indeed, yes. it does. Not, indeed, it does. Not as fancy as mine in here, though. That, that's, that's okay. Oh, you have the pan zoom. I do, on. but I also just have a high end DSLR as the camera in here, so. But my lighting is, is is optimized for makeup tutorials. It is. <laughs> Whereas my lighting is broken today and my heating, so I'm very cold, which is why I'm all like got my zipper all the way up. And we had to use a ladder to turn the lights on because the lighting board is broken in here right now. Mm. But we made it work. Uh, I, wait, I have one of these. Oops. I have one of those um, makeup tutorial lights. I can see is a that... reflection in your pic. Oh, oh look at that. my lord. It's way too much, right? Okay, that's too much, too much, too much bright. And then I have, I have, that I can was, turn it down. Oh, that's better. Turn it, oh, oh, oh. See, and I can do all, and then I'll just shut it off. Okay. We go back to just John. Okay. Not deer in the headlights, John, just John. So someone just pointed out that your door is open, Scott, and I noticed that too. I'm waiting for a small child to wander in. and I'm right. They're not that small anymore. I'm actually, I know, one of my but... small children is getting his hair cut, uh, and I need to, text the haircut guy to see if he got there okay well while okay. you're doing that john you love, I community. Do love the community have you got I anything do. to share with us this week i so much do oh wait a second oh my gosh <laughs> open system preferences it's like logitech would like to record the screen i don't want that i want to instead oh gosh <laughs> things have gone horribly wrong okay wait let's try this again <clears throat> share La, la, la. Someone just pointed out that they only just realized that Scott wasn't actually sitting next to John in the same room. That's how well we had it lined up. Wow. Here's, pro here's proof. <laughs> so that's crazy. I'm trying to share on Teams. Yeah. Um, I may have to switch computers because when I try and share, it only wants to share apps. Of course, I can reach across and touch you as well, Scott, if I go across like this. Oh, wait, here it is. Here, let's do a high five. All right, you ready? Hang on. All right, all right. High five. <laughs> that was as lame as anything. All right. This, this is terrible. Teams is preventing me from sharing in Catalina. You know, Catalina is a little bit of a pain. I don't know if you've known that. How quickly can you just like, get over to Windows or something? Yeah. Speaking minutes. of getting over to Windows, mm. maybe we can just take over we shall. from what from what John is talking about, and I can just take it. What are you trying to do, John? He's trying to well, get the screens I'm... up so he can share the links. So can I, I share, share something? Go for it. Show yes. you something? Go Am I allowed to do that, yep. John? Yeah, I'll, I'll get right back on in a second. What if, I do, what if I do this? What happens? So far, it's just you. We're just looking at, we're looking at so you. So John, like, literally left. He left the call to, to, to get to join. Oh, there you go. So now I can see you. Your thing. Okay. So am I here? Yep. Here. Yep. All right. Cool. So check this out. This is kind of a fun thing that happened yesterday. So I'm on the uh, I'm on the Twitter, mm -hmm. and uh, this this buddy here, he works at GitHub, um, is like complaining. He's like, oh, you know, he's a Mac Linux person. He's like Tmux and all, you know, Vim and all that stuff, right? right. And he's like, ah, oh, this sucks. And it does suck, right? The friction is still there because the out-of-box experience for Windows for a dev isn't quite there yet, right? Mm. So I tweet, hey, let's do a Skype. And everybody else is like, oh, well, like, why do you get, like, concierge <laughs> treatment? What are you, why are you fancy, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, of course, I'm not just going to Skype random person, right? I'm going to go and record it. So we do a Zoom. I was going to do a Camtasia, but it's a hassle. Okay. So we ended up talking for 45 minutes, and we did a video. And he was very generous with his time. And what he did, here we'll see like an ad now. We'll go away from the ad. 
that's the bizarre like we're giving free advertising to these people now okay um i don't know if you can hear that oh, is that freaky looking skip, guy there? Skip, skip. oh can i skip him yeah yeah okay so he was very generous and he shared his actual screen yep. this is his actual computer and we talked about the command prompt talked about wsl we added the windows terminal he was very picky about his theme, so he wanted his colors to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. We went in through the profile, and I actually made a gist in real time and threw my yep. profiles up. So yep. he grabs my gist, created 17 seconds ago, right? And then walked through Cascadia code, gets the colors nice. Then he goes and does a bunch of Emacs things or whatever, I don't understand, and a bunch <laughs> of Python. And we talked about, and oh, and then this was cool. This is me drawing this is my head yes this is me drawing on um windows uh whiteboard you ever use this microsoft, microsoft whiteboard? whiteboard brilliant so i'm on my surface drawing explaining to him how the windows kernel works yep because yep. we're just sharing his screen right then we go and we talk about insiders mode he goes in and he makes a python app and then a go app and then gets it all working inside of uh, visual studio code super cool nice so What's nice about this, look at this, this was yesterday night at 10 o'clock, 3,500 views. How do you have so, how does it have so many views so quickly? Um, my assumption is two things. Some percentage of my subscribers get it, which mm. I think is about 10%, 10 percent, maybe okay. less than 10%. But honestly, uh, other than these two people who suck, yeah. uh, <laughs> I assume that the word gets out, but I also like really did the clickbait title. Yeah. You know, and it's just super. It's just super cool. Oh, and then another thing I did is John back yet? Yeah. Oh, because I'm stretching for time. Um, well, I have. I also have your uh, some other links and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The other oh. thing I did yesterday doo -doo -doo, did this. I showed. I showed you this. No. So you go into startup. Yep. And you do this. Yep. So you map, by the way, this is reversed. I don't know why we did it this way. It should be from and to, but robots.txt is a text file that's supposed to exist. Mm -hmm. You map it to a razor page. Yep. You go to the razor page, you use an environment tag, and you generate a robots.txt that's environment aware. Using razor. Using razor. Very And then you just lovely. give it, that's the trick right there. Yep. Isn't nice. that lovely? Very nice. Yeah. So now, now, oh my goodness, now, I've got this set up. Do, do, do. That's actually the wrong profile. This is the right profile. Bloop. I don't know what secret things I'm giving away here. Me and Mark Downey are really close to moving my blog entirely over to Linux now, which is huge. Nice. We'll do an episode. Look at this. Look at this, kids. Got the blog, the website, the podcast, and my blood sugar all building magically. This is the blog. Yep. Got the pipelines, got the whatnot, got everything working rock solid. So now I've got my staging site up. I'm really close. I just need to do some load testing soon. Yep. And I will have moved all of my websites onto ASP.NET Core and Linux. And then I recently, to your uh, request, uh, on my uh, podcast site at the very bottom, bloop. Ah, very nice. Yes. Look at yes. This. Look at that. Very nice. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Cool. Wonderful. Oh, okay. Let me share my links. Are you with and us now, John? I am. All Can right. you see me? He's trying to blame Yay! the Mac OS. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, projects and stuff, mm -hmm. but um, I, I met a, a fellow in the hallway yesterday. I was up in Seattle uh, hanging out with you, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, Demo. And uh, uh, I met a guy who made a thing called Baguette. Have okay. you know about Baguette? No. Baguette is an alternative NuGet server, okay. and it's done by a guy named Loic, yes. L O I C. Very cool. Lovely individual. He walks by in the hallway, and he was so excited because I was like, Oh, you blogged about Baguette? And I was like, Oh, of course, my pleasure, small thing. And he says, I got 100 stars from your blog post. <laughs> And I was thinking, you know, what we don't do enough as a community is just give the stars, man. Like, love. Give the love. Yeah. Scroll to the top of this, my friends. Scroll to the top of this. And Here's a person who's Bjorn is doing his thing, and he's working on a project. He's been working on it for, it looks like, nine months. He's got no stars. It's called Cloudy CMS. 
There's lots of great CMSs out there, and he's put in one. He's using Mongo for his back end. Mm -hmm. Give him a star. Support these projects. It's really, you know, I blogged for years lonely by myself, and you don't feel like anyone's paying attention. But these are great. He's got a good-looking uh, readme file. It's got He's put the work in to think about um, – what he's doing here, he's got an in-memory database by default, JSON files or Mongo. You can learn about ASP.NET as well as how they think about it. Look at how he did his endpoints. Look at how he did his routing. So I just thought this was a neat project uh, that uh, someone was working on, and I thought that uh, we should share it. And maybe we should start sharing a little bit more not popular projects so that they might be popular. So this yeah. is done by Bjorn Ali uh, Gorenson called Excellent. Cloudy CMS. And look how nice looking that is. Yeah, that's very cool. Lovely CMS. So could be what you need to uh, to get off WordPress. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Bjorn, right. for sharing that. Thank you, Bjorn. So give our friends some stars. Yep. Cool. All right, Damien Bowden, he's, uh, we shared he's got this Certificate Manager NuGet package, and I've shared some other things he's done with this. And so here he's showing how to create and set up certificates for identity server using .NET Core. So like a lot of time getting certificates and creating certificates, a lot of weird like you type a bunch of commands and you don't really understand and stuff. This is kind of like using his certificate manager, you're writing .NET code to create and manage these certificates. Um, so then he goes through and, and shows the setup for identity server. Um, I learned as part of this, this JWKS is Jason Webb, Key something, a Store? key set, Jason key set. Web key set, yeah. So well, that's a goes, heck of a fluent thing there on line four. Line four? Look at yes. That. Yeah. Goodness. Add identity. It's clear, server. but the thing is, you know, say what you will about the fluence, but uh, it's clear what's going on. I I kind of like it. I mean, it's yeah, and you can also dot through it, right? So like, otherwise, you you would it could you'd be like exploring all these docs to figure it out, or you can do dot. Hmm, that looks right, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so cool stuff. So I appreciate he's been going through and and writing these up, um, showing how to use the the certificate manager. So, good stuff there. Okay, Justin, we've had him on the show a couple of times um, since I think back when he was um, intern. Uh, anyhow, he's been he's working on Kestrel with HTTP three. So here he's been tweeting about this and has this endpoint uh, running out in the clouds where you can go through and connect to it if you do the right command line stuff to enable quick and, and HTTP3. So then based on, you know, people are 145 people liked it, 46 people retweeted. So he, he went for it and wrote up a blog post on this. So here he's talking about a, um, ANCM over the past three years and talking about, you know, how what's happened with it. He, he's got this um, fancy. That's, nice, that's nice. I like ASCII um, yeah. uh, diagrams. It's just kind of cool. It kind of just removes a whole decision about how to do it. It really does. <laughs> yep. I appreciate also that people have taken the work. Like, there's so much historical context that's missed in these things, and why people do the things that they do. Yeah. And I appreciate that he took the time to write it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we wrote up like, like you're saying, why we did it, and then he also wrote up, you know, some of the results and some of the things that you know that like they weren't even expecting, like improved startup time mm -hmm. um, for for debugging, right? So um, he's writing about that, and then just kind of continued investments and what what he's working on. And for instance, you know, the work to support gRPC. Um, so good stuff. All right. Uh, so Niels. So I've always just I just assumed his name actually was Swimberger, but it's Swimberg. Mm -hmm. um, but so, uh, Scott, you were talking about hosting with uh, with Linux on your on your site and stuff. This is cool. He's writing up about Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, and some of the stuff like he, as a challenge here, he wanted to support System D um, and then just Kestrel only. Like he, he mentions how to set up reverse proxy, but he says, I'm not doing that. I'm, you know, exposing it locally, and I'm uh, opening ports and all that stuff. So he, he walks through the system D configuration and installation, um, and then he, you know, handles the stuff for automatic restart. Um, he talks about the system D integration package, uh, which has the um, things like it'll notify system D when it's ready and when it's stopping and stuff like that. So the interaction between 
um, between Kestrel and System D. Um, so that's cool. And then he talks about the stuff as far as opening the ports up um, and finally exposing ports AD and 443. So, and he also does talk about the, you know, reverse proxy, which is kind of the more recommended way, but this, this is cool if you do want to bind directly to the service. So, good stuff. Um, we already talked about that. Cool. Uh, Elon blogging updates on the experimental mobile Blazor bindings. So, we had him on the show a few weeks back to show off. Um, as he points out, a lot of good stuff in here, some new... Uh, new controls, also including Xamarin ex Essentials, which makes it easier. So here's the controls. They are very pretty. Um, he also points out uh, Xamarin Essentials, which makes it easier to bind to location-specific stuff, mm -hmm. like geolocation or device status, access clipboard, whatever. Um, so that's cool. Because this is a native app, right? So yep. being able to access device stuff is cool. Um, and, you know, it also talks about stuff like Xamarin Forms. One thing that I also want to point out, which is really cool, is that we're getting community contributions. So I, I always love this when people take the time to call out community contributors. And so he's doing that. So very cool. Sweet. All right. Uh, a few things here. First of all, um, Carl Franklin is on this Blazor tour, and he's um, blogging in here about something he saw from NDC London, Steve Sanderson was talking about sharing UI between client and server. So we've actually got two posts on this. Uh, first of all, he goes through and documents, here's like a step-by-step -step recipe. Go through, create a WebAssembly version, then create a server, a Blazor server, mm. then add references because the Blazor server creates a shared and a, and a client side. So then he, uh, Carl walks through, you know, add reference, to the shared and the client from the server. And then once you do that, you can delete some stuff from the server because you're using your client Razor files. And then you are you think you're done, but you're not totally done because when you run, you get errors. So then Carl talks about, here's the other stuff you got to do. Hmm. So it definitely works. It's it's a way to share the same Razor stuff between both, but there's, there's a little bit of, you know, then do this, then do this. Um, so what's, what's kind of neat here is Joel ty types up uh, creating reusable, interchangeable hosting, building off of what Carl did and using a shared Razor class library. So this is taking that Razor, moving to a Razor class library, and then consuming from CSHTML. Um, so it's- Could you there's... scroll up just a smidge for a second? Sure, tell me when. Do you know that one, <clears throat> That one line there, demo, the app line. <coughs> Excuse me. That's We've improved that now. There's a tag helper for it if you're in CSHTML. That's what I thought. Yep. Thank you. Yep. That was added in 3.1. Is there any reason that you would still need to use this in a Razor class library? I can't, no. I don't think so. Okay, cool. No, I don't believe so. All right, Assuming cool. the class library is one. I mean, this is ultimately, yeah, this is in a Razor page. It's in a host.cshtml. So. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yep. So that would clean that up. Cool. And then he, he talks about hosting and, and um, there's, um, yeah, there's still some stuff you've got to do to make sure that your service references are, are the same between the two and all that. But, but this does kind of clean up and there's less kind of then do this, then move this over here, et cetera. So pretty nice. Continuing our Blazor segment here, we've got Chris Saney, and he's writing up about fragment routing in Blazor. So uh, this is being able to link between specific things um, in a page with those hash URLs. And what he talks about in there is that the problem here is that Blazor doesn't have support out of the box for handling fragment routing. Um, so what he talks about doing is using JavaScript interop. That's a really nice feature of Blazor is that you can, anything JavaScript can do, you can interop with it. Mm. So he creates some extensions there and interops with it, um, talks about some additional optimizations, handling events, um, and then finally using a um, base class to simplify it more, so to generalize it. So the the benefit here, you can kind of see it's a little bit small, but these you're getting these hash URLs, so that allows linking directly to 
um, different things within the page if you want those um, fragment routes. All right, one more in our Blazor segment here. This is from Mateo, and this is just kind of neat. This is client-side Blazor using AWS, so serving from S3 buckets. Um, so that's a neat thing with with uh, Blazor is that it's you know it's um they're just static files, and so you for doing that WASM you can you can host those directly in those client-side buckets. He does talk about some things need to be done, for instance, like HTTP client injection and stuff. So there are some roadblocks he works through. Um, so, and this is, you know, kind of a very early trying some stuff out sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so that's definitely kind of the feel of this post, but it's, it was just kind of a uh, first look at it. And I'm, I'm sure over time that this can be, you know, continue to be improved. So. Cool. Kind of neat. All right, almost done here. Uh, we wish ahead writing a continuing his A through Z series. Here he's writing about forms and fields in ASP.NET Core 3.1. So as he always does is a kind of very exhaustive look. He's, he goes through and writes up the general kind of, you know, the form tag. Uh, he writes up the tag helpers, which definitely kind of clean things up. He writes in additionally some of the things where you can use HTML form fields, so support for things like email addresses, passwords, et cetera. So, um, so that's nice by setting those data types. Mm -hmm. Also digging into things like, uh, you know, check boxes, select lists, hidden fields, et cetera. So using those, uh, those um, tag helpers to do that. And then he's got some other kind of additional things way down at the end for uh, support for things like Blazor. And then one other neat thing is he's been continuing to build out this NetLearner project and he's including all these things that he's doing in part of this NetLearner project as well. So here this is an actual kind of real world, you know, application in this stuff. Hmm. All right, one last thing. So Scott, you blo blogged about this ASP.NET Core samples. Um, so uh, yeah, anything you want to say about this? Or? <clears throat> You know, I, I mentioned the thing about stars earlier. I think that there are these un, unsung heroes out there that are doing work. They're putting stuff out there. They're not asking for money. They're not even. They don't even have a tip jar. Uh, in some instances, I would put myself in that same bucket. Uh, this individual here, though, takes it to a whole other level. Scroll down just a smidge here, and look where it says over 300 samples. Dodi G out of Cairo has been doing this for a long time, and uh, just. Um, systematic, just banging it out. So look at this here. This is 300 different samples for ASP.NET Core. So I look at this site, and I'm like, look at this. And he's offering. He's in the Gitter channel. And if you have any issues, let me know. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Positivity, kindness. Scroll down a little bit. And I'm looking at this, and I let's stop right here. And I say, well, gosh, functional, foundational core 2.1 samples, right? Where are the where are the 3.1 samples, right? You put all this goodness out here, but you don't you don't update it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, scroll up and hit the branch. Ah. Yeah. Look at that. I mean, that's just extraordinary. Click on that. Yeah. 166 commit. He's he's about ready to drop a 3.1 branch on us. Now, yeah. we as a community, if you can't give money, if you can't give someone a job, Appreciate them. Don't don't be mean. Don't put something mean in the issues. Tell them on Twitter, hey, I saw that and I really appreciate that. I saw tweets to him where people said they use it in class. Uh, they use it more than the docs in some cases. Go ahead and hit projects for me there, John. Let me just give you a uh, sense. Wait. Lower left hand left hand side above get attributes. And then just scroll down a little bit here. Generic host, gRPC, six different hello worlds, how to do an image server, how to do localization. It's just nice, yeah. clean stuff, right? How to do, like, pick on any one of the routing ones. Source, clean, boom, go in there. Yeah, yeah, these are very light, just, like, very oh, targeted. Here's how right? to do some routing, a little yeah. discussion of route value dictionary, yeah. a little low level stuff sometimes, high level stuff other times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't see any pull requests. I don't see any pull requests from me. I don't see any pull requests from you. Like, um, I think that it's it's really cool that he's doing all this work, and I think we should appreciate him. Yeah. So sure. yeah, there give, are him, some, give him some stars. Tell him that we don't see any open because he's closing them 
quickly, well, right? He's but, urging them in. But with all, due respect, with all due respect, yeah. real talk, uh, 2023 in the life of the project, uh, this <laughs> yeah. is this is one person really, really doing some serious work. So kudos to Doty. We appreciate you very much. And I hope that other people appreciate uh, this person and others. This the people that are just turning the crank. Uh, people like the Morning Brew and people, you know, people like our friends in the .NET community that make man, manage websites that put great information out there for free. Thank you all. We we appreciate you. Yep. And this this one too is also linked off of the uh, .NET presentations um, repo as well. So that's that's one of the ones we included uh, as another way to find this. presentation stuff. Yeah. Good. Uh, sure. Share, sharing this stuff with our new friends is a really, really important. Uh, I need to update this, right? Last time we added that, Look it was that. 250. Now it it's 300. And it said 180 there. You said over 180. You're going to have to That's fix a, that. There's a lot of updates in there. Yeah. Pull it together, John. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. And all these are in the, um, I'll share this out, but all these are, there's this URL list. People always ask if we're going to share the links. Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. And I'm done. Always. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Back. Back I don't know. It's a little polished. It's a little polished. I know. What are you going to do? We're, we're, it's too good for us. We're, we don't live <laughs> up to it. We don't live up to the quality of the production of the show anymore. This is absolutely the truth. How are we all anyway? Like healthy, health wise? All of it. Uh, my finger's time. still numb. Thank you for. Oh that. yeah. Yeah. yeah how's that, how's that going? Can you type? It's kind of. It's kind of shaped weird. Yeah. What the? So that was like a. A box. Um, I was opening a gift at Christmas, and uh, I was I took this the scissors and I opened them up, like yeah. like like you do. Mm. Yeah. And I went quick down the like I was opening the box. Yeah. And there I hit a crossways tape. Yep. So I was opening them up, and then the Skip. scissors stayed here. Yep. Yeah. And I continued. Oh, and you went down the other side. Of and the I blade. went right across the. Um, See how janky that this is? This is why you use yeah. a box knife to open boxes, not scissors. Yeah, that would allow me to hurt myself faster. No, <laughs> because there's, if, you, if it <laughs> catches, there's efficiency. no blade for you to like pull through on. Yeah, but um, but I can't feel E, D, or C on the keyboard, so there's that. Oh, Ouch, I'm sorry, man. That's, <laughs> that's okay. It'll come back. I got another nine fingers, right? Well, this is yeah. true. This is true. It's not like one you use a lot. Uh, you know, it is what it is, right? It is what it is. This is why we have redundancy in these systems. Mm. There was something I was going to, there was something in one of the shows I was on without you, Scott, and I was going to geek out with you on something. There was some hardware thing, and of course I've forgotten what it was. There's was no, it a dream machine? It may have been. I can't remember. I cannot remember what it was. Oh, so I've done that. Yeah. I did. So yes, it may have been that. I've done. I, did you I have, upgrade to the dream machine? I, this is well, the Ubiquity dream machine. I have the Ubiquity dream. I went from Amplify. And I got all the ubiquity so stuff, and I've got the Dream Machine as my main. So that is both a router, an access point, um, a switch in one device, as you can see on the back there. And it is a Unify controller, which is the ubiquity networking Unify system requires a exactly. controller to map everything. So it includes all those components in one. Previously, you would buy all those literally so separately. phrasing this differently, mm. This is a prosumer kind of a bridge for like a regular Joe or Jane. It's who's like, entry you know, really into the like, Unify system. That's right. I want to get into the Unify world, That's but right. I'm not running a baseball team. Right. And I don't want to go and do an entire warehouse worth right. of it. It's like, it always felt like, Ugh, I don't want to. That's your bridge. Well, that yeah. gets you into the Unify ecosystem. Single device. It's like, it, it's like you went down and bought, you know, a Linksys router, except this yeah. one is a, a Unify router. And it has all the Unify goodness, and so you can extend it to support other stuff. The only thing it doesn't include is the camera controller. So if you want to get into the Protect, the Ubiquity Protect stuff, yeah, you the need cameras, you still need to buy the Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus or whatever. Um, yeah. Or they have a, a UDM Pro, Unified Dream Machine Pro, which is a rack mount device, which does have a hard drive. Anyway, so I've got one of those, and I got you know a nice big 24-port switch rack mount, and I got the Cloud Key Gen 2 for the cameras, but I haven't set up the cameras yet. And I've got my NAS, which I had already, and I got a rack mount UPS, and I got three Nano HD, the Nano HD access points. So they uh, one mm -hmm. someone there, and then I got one of the in wall ones, which you have as well. I know. So put I did me, all my uh, house. I in my, full screen, John. So I um I, I went yeah. So that's what I have exactly yeah. So I have the exact right. same thing running at my house. It's beautiful, and you can see 
Your map works. I have not, there's a bug in the controller software at the moment where I can't create a, a floor plan. And Let so me I, see I can't I do can the nice map thing. show you a floor plan that is not leaking infosec data. I thought you had it on your blog. No, that's a fake. Ah, look at you. Look at you. No, I mean, I'm not going to give you the floor plan in my house. I, of course. Cause, you know. All right, here, here's, a, here's a fake floor plan. Okay. They actually do have one you can just connect yeah, to and yeah. play with. This is, I've got another demo ah, yeah, one as well. But look at this here. See, it says bonus room. This yeah. doesn't exist in my house. Right. Watch. Mm. Yeah, because you tell it what, what material drew, and the thickness and everything is. I drew is. Yeah. the walls. Yep, and it predicts what the signal strength will be. So what, the other thing I learned about doing this is because I had to run cables. You know, I ha my house was cabled anyway for access points, but I didn't have any cabling in the ceilings for putting Wi-Fi access points, right? I only had it for the jacks and the walls. Right, right. So I ran cables, a couple of cables, you know, through floors, So because it's a three-story house, to, to punch from where my rack is down in the kitchen so I could put an access point. And I ran one in the ceiling in the loft all the way full, that was a lot of fun, like doing parkour inside the, the, my roof um, mm -hmm. over my vents and things um, to put one in the loft and that worked all right. But what, I've, you know, what you've soon realized when doing this is five gigahertz Wi-Fi, oh, it does not like going through anything, mm -hmm. like, like even drywall, like it, it is such, it really likes wide open spaces. And then when you walk around a building like Microsoft, like offices here, and even though it's an open plan um, office building, so we have these neighborhoods, right? With like each one has about 12 people in it. There are Wi-Fi access points like every Everywhere. five yards yeah. or so. <laughs> and like, even if I stand, there's one in the middle of our team room. And then there's one literally outside the door of our team room. The door is always open, but they're literally, I want to say 15 feet from each other. And that is like the normal throughout the out the building to get five gigahertz strong signal throughout the building. Yeah, and it requires I a lot of tuning to do it well. After all of doing this, I've still got a little gigabit switch on my desk. Yeah, like, right. I can't really show you, but yeah. right here, there's yeah. a, this switch because just having five ports that are just right there yeah. for all. I, when but I, is it when is, I is it a managed switch, or are you still using like a, a, a horrible old Netgear now? I've got, well, is there a test thing as a tiny yes. five port managed they switch? They have, so Unify, they, you can get eight ooh, port ooh, ooh. smalls and they can get, you can get passive switches from them as well. Okay, hang on. It's just a little TP link that I got years ago. So, so it's all, it's really more of a hub than a switch. I mean, it's a switch, just not managed, right? So you can't like do VLAN tagging and all but the other right. stuff. But you're right. What I really need is a is little, that, there it is right there. Eight port switch. Yeah, it's about 95 bucks. Watts. Oh, that's the 151 is the big one. They have a much smaller one. Well, so I do have the wall-based uh, access point, which yes. itself has That's four right. ports underneath it. That's correct, yes. But it's not wired. You know what I mean? Or what is it? It is it wired. Is wired. It That's what I called. You have a beacon as well, if I recall, and that's not wired. <laughs> so someone's pointing out they have something. Oh, it's Nick. Hello, Nick. They have the USW Flex, which is actually designed to use with their sort of air bridge, uh, their air fibers and their um, cameras, but it's just a switch. Um, and it has four ports of, four ports of power over Ethernet as well. Huh? Uh-oh, what did you unplug? I think he just, like, <laughs> did he just unplug his network? <laughs> that's a that's beautiful awesome. freeze frame that we've got too. Oh, that's funny. Uh oh See, I've got oh, a, I've got that TP He's link back. Echo. He's back. So, so I'm like, oh, I'll just take the hub and I'll unplug it and <laughs> hold it up here and show you the hub. <laughs> so it turns out this computer is on that right now. Yes. So don't <laughs> I, I would be lying if I said I had not done something similar at home before. Oh, I just need to unplug this so I can try. Oh, wait like a second. Seemed like a good Oops. idea at the time. I just yeah. didn't realize it was plugged directly into that. Anyway, I did spend a few weekends setting all that equipment up. Uh, and I do have, I mean, my amplifier was good, right? It was, it was pretty, it was very good. Um, but now I have the power. Now I can see everything that's happening in my network and I can extend it over time. And I, I cleaned everything up. I put a wall mounted rack in the closet. I rerouted all the cables out of the old shallow in wall cabinet and I pulled them back up through the ceiling and dropped them through where the new thing is. So now it's all beautiful and clean. I put a UPS in there. Like it, it, it I'm very happy. I with do it. have this shallow in-wall cabinet. Yeah, That's still that a thing. Problem. Yours is bigger than mine was. Mine is smaller, but yeah, you but can, it's very shallow. It gets messy so very I quickly. So I end up taking my rack-mounted switch, to <laughs> turning it, it sideways. The wall. Yeah. So it's kind of bad. So I, I I do like having a rack, and my NAS fits in there perfectly. The UDM does fit. The Dream Machine does fit in there, even though it's not rack-mounted. And then I've got like my Smart Things hub and my Philips Hue yeah. hub is in there. My spare hard drive for my NAS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
So the only thing, the next thing is to set up the garage. I got another switch to put in the garage. I have to drop a cable from my daughter's room through the wall into the garage. So then I can use that as the, the hub for cameras. So then I can run cabling from the garage outside to do the cameras that I want to do. Um, and put another access point in there, of course, because I want an access point in my garage, um, et cetera, et cetera. So all goodness. But yeah, we should talk about some .NET things. We've got us on here. <laughs> Hanselman, how about a spicy topic? No one's really asked any interesting questions I've seen come past yet. I mean, there's probably a couple mm -hmm. of questions we could talk about. So David Fowler tweeted last week, and then you subtweeted, uh, well, you uh, quote tweeted him and yep. sort of weighed in as well around .NET and complexity in our ecosystem. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> He's taking a breath. So I spent an hour and a half today with a younger person, uh, early in career developer. Yeah. Uh, showing them uh, my podcast website, which is not complicated. Um, it is, you know, five or 10 pages, but it's got a lot going on. It's got health checks. It's got caching. It's uh, highly performant. It's got unit tests. It's got Selenium tests, integration tests. I've got it set up in, in Azure App Service, yada, 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 yada. It is, and in the, in, the, in the hour we were on the phone, we added that robots.txt thing, mm. checked it in, tested it, put, deployed it to production. They were more interested and focused on as an early and career developer in the life cycle mm. and had no problem with the fact that it was not broken up into like 16 layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a razor page with a database class. It's not really a database. It's a third party web service. And the database class talked to an HTTP client or a thing of type HTTP client. Mm. So it was three layers, yeah. three files. This is not complicated. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you could make a lot, you could break out a bunch of stuff. Yeah, maybe I broke Liskov substitution principle a couple of times. Maybe I broke, you know, like, the like maybe it's not Demeter. solid. Law of Demeter, right? You know, but at the same time, though, it's it's, it's more of a suggestion of it's, Demeter. It's, yeah, it's more <laughs> of a law. It's really just, to, you know, it's, it's an it's inkling a of Demeter. guideline that can be abused by the bold. No, yeah. but the point is, 80% is sometimes enough. Mm -hmm. And it was the infrastructure and the sense of, um, the sense of, I don't fear the code base. Mm. I can make changes to that code base and I don't worry. I don't have any psychic weight that I'm gonna mess it up and break the whole thing. Mm. The test will catch it. The deployments process will catch it. The, you know, I can, uh, I, I feel comfortable with it. I feel like, yeah, you could make it more correct, more enterprisey, but would it have added anything? I don't know. So I just feel like we need to have deliberate practice and really be thoughtful about why the complexity exists. I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of Yagni, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to need it. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I needed, when I needed my Selenium tests, I added complexity and layers to support it. Right. right. So it's not necessarily it Yagni, but it's like, don't add it in before you need it. Right? Yeah. I mean, but, it's, and when I did it, I did there. it deliberately. I thought yeah. about, I'm going to need this. I, early on as a junior dev, I worked at a place, well, like intermediate dev, worked at a place where we're building this real estate solution, any deployment, and we had a deadline coming up for this conference, like it had to be deployed, and any deployment took 37 DCOM DLLs being re-registered, mm -hmm. IS resets and stuff. It, like it just took forever to get anything done. And finally, like the architects actually all like moved on to another company. We ended up rewriting classic ASP.NET code generated collection classes. And like our, our development like accelerated through the roof. And like granted, like, and it, you know, like of course we didn't want to undercomplicate it, and you yeah. know what I mean. But we we had like one of our main requirements was it had to be done in time for this conference, you know. <laughs> so it was just so like nice to get it to that point where it's like, what? We don't have to restart the server to like update a field on a page, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I think I think that you and I are agreeing that there's something to be said for thoughtful design and layering and appropriate amounts of complexity, but it is the infrastructure around the application lifecycle that is as important or more so. And that's what I, where I think we should be spending some more of our time. Is it friction-free 
I make the change, I deploy the change, uh, whether or not, is it easily refactorable is almost more important to me than whether or not it's uh, ready to be refactored and has all the complexity that comes with that. What do you think, Demo? I mean, I think it's an interesting discussion. I mean, I've been in the industry long enough on both sides of the fence, both as a you know, the beginner programmer, a consultant, MVP, before now working at Microsoft for 10 years, building these frameworks, that I like to think I've gone through the gamut of, of experience here. So like I remember in the beginning, you would learn about all these patterns and you would work at places and you would, you would be presented with a ball of mud, right? And we go, oh, this thing is completely unmaintainable because everything talks to everything and, and, and it's very hard to, like you said, John, to make a simple change and then you start layering things in order to solve specific problems and then you convince yourself because you've got these new tools in your belt that you need to do this for everything because of all the flexibility it affords you and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I've noticed over time is that generally most folks who go through that process, they, they mature in their understanding such that they have a good sense of how to distill down the actual um, solution to those, those, those sort of patterns we're presenting to the various problems that they, that they uh, claim to fix, such that they can look at a problem, they can solve it in the simplest way possible without falling into that pit of this thing is going to become an unmaintainable mess. Mm -hmm. Speaking to .NET in, in general, in our ecosystem, our language, our tooling experience, our docs, our framework design, I think is, there's plenty of valid feedback there that we need to process as framework and platform owners with how can we, um, how can we have people land in a place where it looks like the language, the framework, the tools, the guidance, the ecosystem is not pushing them into a place or making them feel bad if they don't um, where they should be doing lots and lots and lots of files and you know lots of complexity and lots of decoupling and all that type of thing um, you know VS will very aggressively push you to a file per type today um, mm -hmm. we build frameworks that let you mix uh, different language types like razor and then we see you know very passionate arguments discussions whatever you want to call them um, from people about whether that's right or wrong, as if it's something binary, which of course it isn't. Um, when a lot of the time, you know, you are building something very simple, whether it's a, a website, Scott, that just lists a bunch of podcasts <laughs> where every page is the same and it's just you have a database of stuff, speaking of pantsonminutes.com, yeah. um, or what I'm working on right now, which is a little utility website for internal use where you can put some plain text in and hit a button and it spits out uh, a result based on that text with some examples of how to use it in one of our internal systems. And it's, it's, so it's literally a single page. It's a, it is literally one page. Or the live ASP.NET site that we built before this, you know, five and a half years ago, um, which was one page when it had an admin form behind it. The most complicated parts were things like getting authentication and authorization to work properly. Um, but even when I get to the point of like, I have a single text box form, the person types something into it, they hit send, and then I want to return a result which is dynamic in size, there can be more than one record that's returned, and each one of those records has multiple fields of different types, I find myself going, so do I want to create this class in another folder that doesn't exist yet called models, and should it be in the root of the project, or should it be in the subfolder of the pages thing? It's not going to be shared between anything, it's just this page. Can I just use a nested private type? Is that okay? That, 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 and like I go yeah, through this analysis, entire... Analysis paralysis. Right, and because C Sharp doesn't have record types, it doesn't have a lightweight object literal sort of things. It has anonymous types, but they're not great for binding, obviously. Um, so it doesn't lend itself to the same type of uh, very simple approach that you might see in a JavaScript-based templating system where you can just like create objects. So there's no scheme, you just create objects and then you bind them because it's all runtime matching, right? In .NET, our systems don't tend to work that way because we're all type-based by default. So you have to declare the type somewhere, you have to put it somewhere. Um, now, the tooling is very good, right? Like we have F12 navigation, we have control comma for go to code, like we have all those things that we talk about on stage, but they're all designed to work with complex code bases, right? If you think about it, obviously, we, those things don't, aren't generally needed unless you have more code. And then we argue as a, as, a, as a community that, well, real systems get complex and you need to separate things apart to make them more flexible as they get more complex and thus you need tools and language semantics like TypeScript and all those type of things to make them scale. We use the term scale to say well, that won't scale, like that pattern won't scale, or that language won't scale, or that app framework won't scale. And it might mean to the size of the code base or the number of users working on it, like those, those two things can apply. Um, 
but that lends it that tends to lend itself and, and i'm not saying any of that's wrong what i'm saying is that it does seem to lend itself or it can easily eventuate in a result whereby someone who's new to the platform who might be learning finds it really hard to find an example of how to just create a page that requires someone to log in and shows one thing suddenly they're mm -hmm. presented with examples that have literally 20 files in a project where there might be five different file types each with their own unique set of concepts that you would have to learn and have an arc of learning and you know mastery and all the rest of it some are tooled better than others um, understanding lots of language idioms and language semantics to understand lifetimes of when objects are created all the rest of it dependency injection is a wonderful thing in the ASP.NET core by default I still stand by that it just removes a whole layer of thinking for me um, but if you don't use it sometimes I go oh maybe it's simpler not to use it I literally did this last night and then I found myself trying to create all these statics and as soon as I had statics I wanted state to go somewhere I had static state and it all got super complex and then I moved it into a single class that I registered as a singleton and then it was easy again so sometimes these underlying systems that some folks will interpret as being complex can actually lead to simpler solutions if you just lean on them but that creates debates of its own but you know going back to the to the repo that you showed at the beginning John where we just had lots of like pithy examples I want to know <laughs> how to do X where X can be like literally expanded to hundreds and hundreds of different small examples wouldn't it be great if there were small focusings to do that if I go through our docs today it's probably fair to say our docs aren't really structured that way they're more like a journey and if you dive if you kind of land in one place especially as a new person it can be difficult mm -hmm. to get all the required context and sort of a prior understanding to really make sense of what's being said in any given page um, then it, there's like a base level you have to get for anything right before you can uh, you can understand what it is that's being presented to you and I you know we have a couple of tutorials I think that are designed you were involved in these Scott and you John I think about for, for, for very new folks but there's only a few of those there's that we don't have 300 tutorials that are designed to teach all the different aspects of the system I don't think we have a very long even like multi-day tutorial style thing that's in the doc site right like we have a tutorial we have a couple of sort of couple hour tutorials we don't really have a like if I go to one of the other frameworks I think like um angular had used to have like a t an 18 chapter book basically that was their tutorial section and you would start at chapter one saying right let's do hello world and you would go all the way through unity um, has more had, unity has stuff nerd, like that right we had nerd dinner yeah right like, nerd dinner was a book do we, right? do we do that again right it was 88 88 pages right we and, have and we a have lot those, of architectural documents that's and diagrams. yeah yep. but those architecture ones get heavy pretty quick right and they do, but, do and, present I, the and i'd argue they're probably designed for a different audience um, you know, a lot of the time those architecture books are designed for the type of people who work at the type of places where they want to be told, give me the 400 page reference manual for how to build my systems, knowing that you've, you've done all the thinking about it already to figure mm -hmm. out how it will work well, given all the solutions that you offer. It's much more like solution in a box from a vendor as opposed to, yeah. And it's prescriptive yeah. from one point of view, rather than what you see in some of the other communities that aren't. That are sort of be more uh, what's the term more vendor diverse maybe than ours um you know we're one of the only sort of single vendor platforms left in the way that we are you know we're open source dotnet foundation owns the code already but the product is owned by microsoft it's owned by our team and we have a scope of you know things that we provide solutions for and then that is expanded by the rest of the stuff in the community right but there's a very core set that we deliver because it's strategically important for our platform to have those things um, mm -hmm. And then there are integration points between like .NET and like Azure DevOps as a as an application lifecycle management thing, and then like Azure as a as a as a cloud solution and Visual Studio as a tool thing, etc. etc. Et and there are interface points, and we try to make those things work well. Um, but there are seams because there are different teams, and there are cycles and schedules and docs live in different places, and we're continually refining that. We talk about this stuff all the time um, about where those gaps are and how we can make them better. But it is different in terms of we do it that way because we're one company whereas in other ecosystems it looks very different to ours a lot of the time it is a groundswell of like-minded likely interested community folks who decide this is a problem we have to solve it we're going to do a thing and we're all invested in it whereas over on our side of the fence in the .NET world we don't have as many of those we have those as well we just don't have as many of them and that's a whole mm -hmm. other discussion on you know, that's a tangent we could go off from there about the whole .NET open source thing and everything. But I think this does lend, it is related. It comes back into 
how approachable is the .NET ecosystem? Not the .NET platform, the ecosystem, which includes the platform and it can use, includes the docs and the community and the tools, everything, right? How approachable is that ecosystem for new folks, for new developers? Um, and I still you find know, myself battling with the complexity of the frameworks that I help design. <laughs> yeah, you know, one thing that, there's a difference between frameworks and applications, right? So like that that was something you've mentioned, both those words, and you know, like the team is, is most of the time focused on building a framework. And that's a case where you really do wanna focus on the patterns and the API design and you spend all that time, like the design and also changing the API is painful for everyone else down the road, right? Whereas if I'm evolving an application that's a website, yes. I can change the code all I want, right? Yeah, it's called so, software for a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but so I think that's something where internally, like if you look at the code that Microsoft writes, they're solving a different problem than me as an application developer a lot of the time. Yep. And I think that's something you've you talked about even well before we started the call. Uh, like you've been doing some application building yeah. yourself. And I've always loved that, like when you built stuff like the ASP.NET community stand-up website, mm. that drove you towards things like tag helpers and some, and you know what I mean? And, that, yeah, yeah, all types of stuff. Yeah. So, and I, I always think that's really cool when the team does those application building things that really helps drive like, whoa, this is painful, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, or we can simplify this model. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, I know, and I know Scott just talked about, I think it's Maria on your team, Scott, that just talked about the different learning approaches and how we have, a lot of us on this team for a long time have been very bottom up oriented when we think about, I mean, the bottom is drawn somewhere, right? Your bottom might be different to my bottom. Or well, no, but it's, but your but like, point is like, oh, I'm gonna make a website. Well, a packet comes on the network. Yeah, that's, that's very low, but like it might be, <laughs> even if it's like, well, you, there's gonna be a process somewhere. You're gonna write an app, there's a server. And what that is, 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 a, is it's a process that opens a TCP socket. And then on, on the end of that TCP socket, you have a line of code that is going to you know, parse HTTP and then return results. Whereas other folks go, uh, no, you know, .html file, put a, some tags in it, and then open it in the browser, right? And then they learn from the pixels back. And as far as they have to go back in order to be productive, which is a lot more practical when you think about learning something in order to be, you know, to use it for fun or even to use it for work. But then there's a, there's, you know, and I know you talk about this a lot, Scott, about how valuable is it? How do you find that line where it's, how far down do you go one layer extra, you know, one layer level of implementation or abstraction deeper right. in order to get a deeper level of understanding so that when you hit a problem, you can, right. you can diagnose it from first principles because you have so, that little bit of extra understanding. Uh, funny example or weird example. Uh, I, I just literally five, 10 minutes ago got my test results. I get my diabetes tests every three months and I get my blood tests. I can, most people can look at the thing and they go, oh, cholesterol or heart rate. And then that's about all they know. That's mm. your lay person. Then the next person, like a diabetic, I can figure out about 10 or nine, you know, 10 or 10 of these numbers. And I'm looking here and it says my cholesterol is good. And I've got some number that's a little high here. I know it's high because mm -hmm. I've been doing this for a while. I know that if it's high, bad things happen. But I'll talk to my wife, who's a nurse, and she'll say, oh, the leukocytes are like, J -j -j and I'm just like, eh, you know, and she like <laughs> feels it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Right? So I can go and say, well, you know, the WebSockets, have, uh, are they're getting retries or whatever. And then uh, David Fowler would be like, you know, the electrons, have, <laughs> you, know, you know, they're bouncing off of the thing when the neutrons and the polarity. Okay, man, like, that's cool. If it feeds your spirit, yeah. awesome. If it makes you a better worker, great. You know, my dad likes to, like, take apart engines and put them back together again, but I can still turn left and right in the car, so I don't really sweat it. Right. And that is all interesting from, like, a, a human learning and what feeds your spirit point of view and all the rest of it, and even having an interesting discussion about how different people in our industry, as we mm -hmm. strive to be more diverse and all that type of thing, um, think about tech as opposed to traditionally, oh, it's only for tech people, right? Bingo. Um, then as platform owners, it's a whole other mm -hmm. set of yeah, issues yeah, yeah. for us to deal with because it's like, okay, it turns out there are different ways that people like to learn. It turns out that if, if, if so-and-so Googles for this search term to find out how to use something in ASP.NET Core and we land them on a docs page, yeah. this person may be wholly satisfied and this person may get lost in the first paragraph and go, oh my God, this thing is assuming I know 40 other things that I haven't even started thinking about yet because I just got Hello World Razor pages working. So yesterday, true story, I'm doing that 6502 low level, I'm building a process yeah. from scratch, right? 
and and the 10 to 12 year old sits with me for a while and he fades away i'm like hey, why don't you think this is interesting you know why don't you care about things i care about and he just floats away yeah. but then i showed him ip config and now he can connect his minecraft directly to his brother's minecraft and he's like oh well you know ports ip that's on a high port you know you need to make sure you put the colon and then yep. the port number because now it applies to his project and yep. now he cares and he wants to know all about software and networking. He's not into it for it, the sake of being into it. He's into only it only because, because he cares about Minecraft. And it's no different to my son who doesn't even play video games a lot. He just watches them on YouTube, which frustrates me no end, but I'm the dad, right? So of course it's going to. Um, he knows what ping time is because they talk about it in the YouTube videos. <laughs> and he knows if the ping time is high, you get lag. Oh, yeah. He's right? in the other room right now screaming, you lagging, it's right. lagging, why is it lagging? So they understand that part. And then I think back when I was 15 and I was like setting up home networks or networks in the computer shop I worked in in order to play Warcraft 2 and like Wolfenstein and stuff against each other. So I learned about the difference between IPX, XPX and TP TCP IP or Laplink cable networking only so I could play games. It wasn't for <laughs> any really other reason, right? So it's a, it's a similar thing, but obviously I was... There was obviously something else I got out of it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have continued right. on the track. You're I optimizing did. for the thing you're interested I, in. That's you, great. you tend to do that. And so... Yeah, it's funny how that works. So like bringing it back to this, to the, to this initial discussion, we talk a lot about, you know, .NET has grown wonderfully over the past five years, especially since we've embarked on this journey of sort of modernizing and building a, you know, building .NET Core and bringing things over to it and all the rest of it. Mostly because of the ASP.NET community stand-up. Mostly because of what we've done. That's yeah. right. When we started in the meeting room back in building for you know, with a whiteboard, and then it's all because of that. Um, and yet, and 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 .NET, you know, in terms of customer use and active developers and stuff, the numbers are all great. They're all going the way they should be going. You know, Ms. Scott talks about them. Scott Hunter, our boss, talks about them at Build. He'll do another update of this year's Build, I'm assuming. But you know, it's millions, and 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 it is, it's very good. But there's still. A, um, a running concern, I guess it's probably not too strong a word. I get, I'm concerned about it. I think about it enough that I think it's a concern. I know Scott and I, you, you, we talk about it a lot. Like what, how, what do you have to do to attract new developers to what is ultimately an ecosystem that's over two, deco two decades old um, and is still perceived by a lot of folks as being old? And so, then we talk about all the things we just talked about with complexity and landing in docs yeah, and what yeah, is yeah. the grow up story and all that type of stuff there's only so much that we can answer because in the, and on this particular community stand-up, we are three old people, three old men specifically. Uh, but I, the older I get, I'm, I, I don't think I am the person qualified to say what we should and shouldn't skip. Mm. And I want to be able to say, oh, well, you need to learn about this, you want to learn about that. I spent a bunch of time recently on the phone with someone explaining processes and threads. You know, I think that's just good stuff to know. But I don't know if that's good stuff to know well it's know not even it's not even just skip that. that even if you can decide is it good to know or not once you've decided it's good to know when in someone's journey right. of learning about dot net well, should they know about processes so look and at threats? look at how rails succeeded when it first taught people how to do rails mm. right it was like let's just generate a blog and you go Bloop, blog and then five minutes nine minutes you have a blog they, mm -hmm. they yada, yada, yada over 99% of the complexity in Rails, right? Mm. But we tend to start people at startup.cs. And we don't, we consciously don't say ignore that. It's hard. Yeah, I know. I guess so. But, I mean, but it's hard to do I've that. Done both. I mean, do anything, I, yeah. if you want to do anything interesting, you're into the routing table. Well, it's not about I used, interest, to, yeah. I used to start, like when I would teach MVC, I would just start with like file new project, check out this view. Hey, let's change it to say, hello, my name. You know what I mean? And you play with it like that, and then you peel back the layers. Razor Pages depends. is the gateway drug. Razor that, Pages that makes that it, one. I even think back to classic ASP, because you didn't need a server. It was part of the OS. Things were simpler when everything was part of Windows. Well, you okay. would drop a file in a folder, one file, hello.asp, like, and I you could just literally put, you know, a Bumblebee yeah. hello on it, and it works, right? Yeah. And today's equivalent proj for basic projects, right. and, razor pages by default. I'm and if you, you look that. at Node, um, Node has a very similar sort of getting started story in that you download the SDK, which is just an exe and is also the runtime. You don't need a project file. You don't need a packages file. You just need one JavaScript file. You can say hello.js or app.js. Yep. And yep. It, all it contains in it is console write line or three lines to start a web server and return hello world on every request. And mm -hmm. you've done something. You've 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 gone from zero to success in literally you know under five minutes, like well under five minutes. And because JavaScript is a language, 
you can start with a single expression and as such, you don't need to learn any of the other constructs. You don't need to know what classes or modules or if statements or loops or any of that stuff is. Or why is there a curly brace? What does that do? You don't need to know any of that to get Hello World working. Today in yep. C Sharp, you do. There's a proposal out right now for C Sharp 9 to allow um, top level statements in C Sharp 9. And I am super, super excited about the potential of that, specifically when it comes to learning and to very simple applications, especially in this world of where people are, yeah, there's a tendency in some places to create smaller applications. I could say microservices, but whatever. Break down bigger things into smaller things that do less, okay? Um, especially when you've got some type of underlying substrate or orchestration layer like Kubernetes or a PaaS or something that's taking but care of a lot of the stuff for you or a functions, you know, like a serverless environment. You want less ceremony, right? Because you're probably going to end up with a simpler application because a lot of the other concerns are being taken care of before it even hits your code. You want something simpler. Now, I know functions, I think, in Azure uses CSX, or they have a support for CSX, right? The yeah. Roslyn scripting thing, which is one option. And then in C Sharp 9, as I said, there is now a proposal out being debated publicly about this top level statements thing. And that would literally allow you to start with. You know, you download the .NET SDK, you have a .NET command, that you create, you have a folder, and inside that folder you could, in theory, today you still need a project file, so there's, you still need that one extra file, um, but then you could just have, you know, app.cs, and it has one statement in it, and that could be console write line, and it would work. And then you can grow up from there. You don't need to do all the, now, then you start getting into all the other it's interests. It's all I've ever asked for. But then, but then it snowballs, right? It's, it starts out simple, and getting that first step to be easier is is as simple as I just said. I mean, I'm, but, not, I'm but, not trying but, to belittle but it, but then you get that's to that. okay though, right? You no, start fine. with a soapbox derby, and then at some point you put in a differential, and it gets complicated. That's fine. Well, that that's fine. As if, long as if, you if have the ability, step. you know, like you have conventions, and then you can dig down. And, you know what I mean? Each, if you, each when you need step it. has to be palatable though. Where we run into trouble, and we've all you remember we, we we would talk about the happy path, and then the cliff that's on each side of the happy path when you fall sure. off as framework designers. When we when we think about these learning arcs, we do have to be careful about, okay, so you go from hello world to I want to start a web server, right? Which might be the next hello world. Well, mm -hmm. we don't have any of that in the default namespace, right? Namespaces and, and, and type organization is a thing in C Sharp. And so you can go from having a default namespace, which includes system.console, so you don't need to think about it. It's not there, you don't have to learn about it to say hello world, but as soon as you want to return something, then you have to. And we unfortunately didn't design the APIs in ASP.NET Core six years ago with that type of arc in mind. And so to get a web server going, you need at least three namespaces, I think, today. You and just then, need the my namespace. And I could say my. And, I mean, server. you laugh, you laugh, <laughs> but yeah. we, if you look at the namespaces in ASP.NET Core today, this is something we regret. There, we have nothing in the root namespace. There's actually nothing that lives in Microsoft at ASP.NET Core. Mm -hmm. um, everything um, is off in some sub namespace of that. And so like given our time again, we would have thought a little harder about what we wanted mm -hmm. to be in that really core privileged namespace. And we could have really optimized that for this type of thing that we're talking about here, that 80% that learning scenario type stuff. Scott. I have to go yes, get my son. Of course you do. All right. It has Sorry, been an hour. That? No, it's been an hour. So that absolutely makes sense. That was a good discussion. We should do more of this. Stuff. Yeah, that's was great. Shiny. All right. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Hooray. Hooray. It has been wonderful, and I will end the stream. Bye. <laughs>